you see coronavirus, the global economy, supply chains, um, how will this fundamentally change the economy? Firstly, it's got to shrink the economy because one, we're just either not able to spend or we're not going to get the goods and services that we were getting previously. And then the knock-on effect to those less developed countries that rely on that spend is going to come. So how big and how long that goes on for is, is a hard read. Um, it's, it's whether how quickly they can contain this, whether it turns into a full-blown pandemic or it just gives us a shot across the bowels that we can deal with. I've not heard of people coming up with cures yet. So unless we're starting to look at that, because mm. you can guarantee the strain will evolve, right? So where we are now, <clears throat> unless they can do something quickly, that it's going to get worse. Is this the first big domino to uh, crash planet Ponzi? Yeah, I, I believe seriously that this pandemic, I, th I think it's already a pandemic. I think that this is the first domino to fall. But I think it's actually the spark in the tinderbox created by the central banks and the thing's just going to go poof. And they're going to look for this to place the blame. And you know the blame should be placed squarely on the heads of the central bankers. And we need to say, we can't look for the guys who caused the problem to come up with a solution. Because as Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting to achieve a different result. Welcome, Renegade Inc. Mitch Feierstein, friend of the show. Uh, always a pleasure. Welcome. It's great to be back here in the studio in London Live. At last. Um, that clip we've just seen, uh, you were right. It was the, the first big domino to fall. Where are we now uh, insofar as markets, central banks, and now we're on the other side of the pandemic? Uh, where, where do you see we are? Well, you know, as we discussed back then, I think this COVID crisis, it was a major crisis and pandemic that we predicted and spoke about, mm. allowed the governments and the central banks to print enormous quantums of money. But this has been a trend going back to 1998, if you think about it. The first bailout was long-term capital management, which was $1 billion. Oh, that's like chicken feed now. Eee, chicken but, feed. Right? And then you went to the next crisis which was the dot-com bomb in 2000, 2001, where the NASDAQ dropped from 5,200 intraday down to 1,600. Then you went to Bernanke's housing crisis, don't worry, nothing to see here, wallop. Correct, which was probably what? Close to a trillion dollars in bailouts. So they're yeah. getting exponentially larger and larger. And then, of course, we went to the, the now we're at the COVID crisis, which is the, the next crisis, which is tens or hundreds of trillions of dollars in bailouts and guarantees hidden. And, you know, I guess the next crisis will probably be the climate crisis, ah. which is QE extension again. So, so what are you getting at here? That all these crises are uh, camouflage, if you like, for, for central bankers, policymakers to print more money and throw it into what is a broken economy? Yeah, well, actually, it's a broken system. And I, I think what it's done is it's, it's bailouts for billionaires and it eviscerates the middle class. But um, when you talk about uh, climate change being the next, what you're getting at is it's the next scam. Am I reading that right? Because what we've seen with COP26 is uh, lots of uh, private jets flying in. Is what you're saying, I'm reading between the lines here, that they're flying in for handouts? Yeah, absolutely. The billionaires want to collect part of the trillions. I mean, now, the biggest problem with, with climate change is you had 400, 400 private jets flying in, mm. the richest people in the world. And Bill Gates, of course, was on a yacht with Jeff Bezos having a birthday party on the biggest super yacht in the world, which Did, is- Were you invited? No, I wasn't. I was snubbed again. I guess I'm not getting Christmas cards from anybody anymore for being on this program. Well, we're doing something right. Yeah, exactly. But the, the issue is, look, if, if people were serious about climate change, then they would tax these private jets something like 250000 to 500000 to land in any airport. Not going to happen. Exactly. Of course it's not. But it's, they're 50%. Private uh, jets are 50% of the aviation emissions. So if they really wanted to make a change, you could do that. But look, the Duke and Duchess of Disney out in California, <laughs> commonly known as Harry and Meghan, I mean, fly around in private jets and they lecture people from their $14 million lectern out there to tell people, do as I say, not as I do. Vladimir Putin recently uh, came out and he said, we are not like the West. He said that we don't print money like candy papers to solve any economic or 
uh, societal problem that comes up. Uh, he also said that he's spoken to the central banker, his central banker, and he said, how is our economic plan coming along? And he compared um, her to um, central bankers in the West, saying actually she's way more fiscally responsible. Do you agree with that? Well, absolutely, because if you think about it, in the late 90s, Russia had a bond default, so they learned their lesson on fiscal imprudence. And now Russia probably has one of the um, best-run central banks in terms of oscillating between surplus and slight deficit, but they really don't have, they're probably one of the least debt debtor nations that, that are out there right now. So they're fiscally responsible. And I think the West believes in the Stephanie Kelton model of uh, magic money tree, AKA modern monetary theory, who's advising Bernie Sanders, crazy Bernie, who's running the head of the Senate Finance Committee. And he just thinks, get those printing presses on 11 out of 10, because we're just gonna keep printing, printing, printing. And you know, this is, is, is ending badly. As we're seeing in a lot of the numbers, I think we have a PPI chart. Talk which us through it. Talk illustrates, okay, so this illustrates that the central bankers are yet once again lying about inflation. Why, because, because they said it was gonna be transitory. Right. Turns out it's here to stay. Yeah, that's exactly right. But we discussed this before, months ago, in another clip, and I said it's definitely not transitory because you're seeing ancillary signs that real inflation is probably cl closer to 20%. Mm. I mean, look at the PPI chart. It's it's just gone. It's gone uh, ballistic. It's it's just gone off the charts. Off the charts. Printing more money. If we come to the U.S. margin debt uh, now, this uh, chart is in the billions. Just uh, talk us through it from an investor or a money manager's point of view. Tech bubble, housing bubble, tech and housing bubble. If you look at the margin debt uh, at the bottom here, mm -hmm. it's dropping off. Uh, what does this tell you that's going to happen in markets? Well, it, it's it's not telling me a lot, except it's telling me that there's an overextension and we're in one of the most egregious bubbles. It's a grotesque asset bubble and the it's manifesting itself in the valuations in the equities markets, the bond markets, the property markets, and the credit markets. And this can only end one way, and that's very badly. You've been warning about this for an awfully long time. Did you ever think that the money printing would be on this scale? No. That's the problem is that you can't, and I've always made a caveat saying that you can never pick the top of an outrageous bubble like this. You also have a mantra. What, that you can never taper a Ponzi scheme? <laughs> and this is, they can't, they can't really taper this. And that's why when they tell you that they're going to raise interest rates, they can't. Because what? if you figure out what the actual total amount of debt is, when they raise the interest rates, they won't be able to pay the interest on the debt. So it just cut, it crashes the right. economy. That's exactly right. Uh, one of the big problems that we see uh, economic commentators constantly talking about the stock market as if it's the real economy. Uh, and no one really makes the uh, disconnect, actually, uh, because there isn't a connection between the two, is there? Um, now what we're seeing are huge amounts of money uh, borrowed at almost zero and then used to uh, buy back stock. Just explain that uh, and what that does to a, a company and why that doesn't really reflect what's going on in the real economy. Okay, well, it doesn't reflect what's going on in the real economy. We've got a record amount of buybacks right now in the U.S. stock market. It's going to be well over a trillion dollars, it's estimated, by the end of this year. So basically what the, the, the corporate, the CEO suites are doing is they're buying back stock and saying, oh, our earnings went up because the multiples are different. So all the CEOs are making boatloads of cash. Because their pay is... Uh, right. Linked. linked to the stock or they're being paid in equity. But if you look at interest rates, again, going back, you said near zero. No, actually, when you look at real interest rates, they're negative. They're deeply negative. And, you know, quite frankly, if 30 years ago you told me when I entered these markets and a little bit longer, you saw 18 percent treasuries or 20 percent interest rates, if you told me that there'd be trillions of dollars in negative interest rate yielding bonds. I'd, tell, I'd have you put in a straight jacket and taken away to a mental institution. There's no way anyone would ever believe that would be possible. So this is where we've come. So it's a complete monetary insanity, but it will come back to haunt people in, the term, in terms of hyperinflation, I think. Do you think that? Because everyone always uses the uh, you know, parallel of, the, of Weimar Germany. Do you think that's really the case? Well, I think that it has to happen eventually because 
it's just a, a matter of a time series. I mean, as we discussed in the opening part of this, the show, you went from 1 billion in bailouts now to hundreds of trillions in less, in what, 20 years, a little over 20 years. So eventually you're gonna hit the end of the road and US dollar hegemony is gonna be what suffers this eventually because somebody, I don't know if it's gonna be China, Russia, or a combination of other countries is gonna come out with a currency linked to hard assets like oil, copper, silver, gold, and exchangeable, fungible for something. Because right now, what you know, a currency is a promise of a government to repay its debt. So the US dollar is the reserve currency of the world. It's been for a little over a hundred years, you know, before that sterling for four hundred years. But when people realize that the United States cannot pay back its debt, then obviously people will lose faith in it. And if another country like China says, we're gonna have a gold-backed yuan, then that's going to be the dominant currency. So I see that as happening. It can happen overnight and that will cause a massive problem. You know, and we already have um, hyperinflation in selected asset classes. I mean, look at the exponential increase in housing prices when if you, inflation adjusts for real wages back to 1980, we're flat to lower. Mm. So there's gotta be a correlation to earnings and house prices. And when those markets become untethered to each other, you're ripe for a disaster. Are you starting to see that in the bond market? And does it start in the bond market? Because now what we're starting to see are negative yields. Well, yeah, the, the, problem with, the problem with the bond market is all of the supply and what's called debt monetization, which is illegal. Oh, or it's, that's all very technical for our but, viewers, just but, to, in, in, in layman's terms. So, Basically, a way that a government funds itself is yep. by issuing, issuing bonds yep. and they pay interest rates. But basically, the interest rate is no interest. we pay, yeah, exactly. We pay you nothing, but you'll, you'll, you know, it's just like WEF said you'll be poor and you'll own nothing and you'll like it. That's Klaus I think you'll, Schwab's. You'll be grateful. Right. Klaus Schwab's great reset. And this is part of it. You know, they issue bonds, but you've you never have, had it so good, people. Right. But you have, you have one government entity issuing the bonds and another one buying them. It's right. like you have, you have 20 quid in this pocket and you say, oh, I'm gonna take it from this pocket and put it in this pocket. And you know, wow. what have you really accomplished? That's, mm. that's financialization. It's the same thing with the stock buybacks. All you're doing is bringing earnings from the future to today so you can put it in your pocket, but then you cannibalize the, co the company going forward. So you, you're destroying um, a profitable growing organization. Instead of using debt to build something, you're destroying something and taking a profit out. But there is a silver lining to all of this because there are undervalued assets out there. I want to congratulate you. For? We have gone for at least 20 minutes now and you haven't mentioned Tesla or Elon Musk. Oh no. Now ordinarily I'd have a bell on this table because viewers have spotted that it's your hobby horse. Yeah, it is. But and I'm bringing it up this time. Okay. Because the poster boy for all this um, is a company called Tesla, headed by Elon Musk. Over to you. Okay, so we. And when I say the poster boy for all this, I say mean to qualify it, the poster boy for all this financial lunacy. Well, it is. I mean, because if you if you think about, you know, Harvard Business School will probably do a case study in irrational exuberance, bubbles, and PR hype. I mean, he pro Elon Musk and Tesla probably have 20 positive articles that come out a day. I don't know what they're paying for. Tesla's market cap is over, well over $1 trillion. Now, that is bigger than the other nine major auto companies in the world. I think their market cap is around $852 billion. And they actually make a profit. He doesn't really make a profit with Tesla. So this is really all hype, PR, and, and wild speculation in, I think, call options that, that are in the market. So um, that will eventually have to come back to a real, you know, come back to the ground because his valuation is just in the stratosphere, higher than a SpaceX rocket.